Welcome, it's Paul with a script designed to illustrate the central limit theorem, confidence intervals, and some of the rather complicated mathematics behind the student t distribution. Let's start with the central limit theorem, and I've always thought one of the most interesting issues here is what happens if you start with a highly skewed discrete distribution. It seems very strange that if you add together enough copies of this, it should look like a normal distribution, but that in fact is the case. So here's the distribution I have in mind. You're playing roulette in a casino where they don't count zero on the wheel, and you're betting on your favorite number. That means you've got one chance in 36 that you win 35 chips, 35 chances in 36 of losing one chip, and this is a fair game. Your expectation is zero. The variance of this random variable is 35. And let's take a pretty big sample. We're going to play 100 games and add things together. I can manipulate sample in order to do this. The possible outcomes are minus 1 and 35. Their probabilities are 35, 36, and 136, respectively. And we're drawing 100 samples with replacement. Here's what a sample looks like. Got a lot of minus ones and a few 35s. The mean is going to be fairly close to zero. And we calculated the variance at 35. The sample variance should be fairly close to that. Now, if we want to apply the central limit theorem, remember, we have to divide by two things. We have to divide by the standard deviation, and we also have to divide by the square root of the number of samples. And the result should be approximately a standard normal distribution. Well, we can do this over and over again. Let's do it 10,000 times. That's the same line of code. And here's the histogram. And that's just no normal distribution, is it? First, it's certainly discrete. There are only a small number of different values that can show up. But second, the original distribution was skewed strongly to the right, plus 35 versus minus 1. And that property persists in the samples. The problem is the central ther limit theorem applies, but in an extreme case like this, we need very large samples. So let's go to samples of 20,000 and try again. Do exactly the same thing, sample over and over again. We look at the mean and variance. Well, they're close to 0 and 1, but that's not what the central limit theorem says. That's based on much weaker assumptions. The central limit theorem says the distribution should be approximately normal. And now that's looking pretty good. And if we overlay, overlay the graph of the density function for the standard normal distribution, it matches pretty well. So what you should be learning about the central limit theorem from this is the following. If you start with a distribution that's not too different from a normal distribution, nice big peak in the middle and some modest tails, samples of modest size will end up with a distribution that's quite accurately standard normal. But if you start with a skewed distribution, you need very big samples for this to work. Now let's work on confidence intervals. I encourage you to read section 7.1 of Chihara and Hesterberg, which is my ins inspiration for this. What we're doing is we're sampling from a normal distribution where we know the variance, but we don't know the mean. And what we're trying to do is take one sample and generate two random variables, which I've named u and l. With u, I've added enough to my sample mean that I say the probability that I've got a number that's bigger than mu is 97.5%. And l is the same, except I've got a 97.5% probability of being less than mu. What do we know? We know sample mean is normally distributed. Its mean is mu. And because we're averaging together n samples, the variance is down by a factor of n, sigma squared over n. If we know the value of sigma, 
like say it's 4, we can calculate a value with the property that the value we have has a sample mean that is 95% likely to lie in between the mean minus some quantity and the mean uh, plus that same quantity. So let's try this. We'll set up our parameters. Mean, standard deviation, and sample size. And if you study your lecture notes carefully, you'll discover the thing that we need to add on is the 97.5% quantile for the standard normal distribution multiplied by the standard deviation of the distribution, that's assumed to be known, divided by the square root of the number of samples. So that says add on 1.10. Let's plot that. And here's what we know. We have a 2.5% chance of being unlucky in generating a sample mean that's here, a 2.5% chance of being unlucky on the other side, and generating a great big sample mean that's over here. So let's try this out. We'll do it a thousand times. Set up a counter to count the number of times we're successful. Set up a blank plot that will eventually replicate one of the diagrams in Chihara and Hesterberg. And what are we going to do? We're going to generate a random sample. We're going to add on to this the quantity x dot add that I just defined. If, as a result, we created something bigger than the sample mean, we will add one to our counter. And the first hundred times, we will plot a value on the plot. So here goes. You can see those plots have shown up. We'll draw a vertical line at the true mean. And how did we do by adding on the right amount? Well, 98.1% of the time, the quantity u that we calculated exceeded the true mean. Looks as though it's working pretty well. We can do the same thing on the low end. And the only difference here is this time we're subtracting that quantity x dot add from the sample mean that we get. Draw a vertical line at the true mean. And this time, we appear to have subtracted about the right amount, because 97.2% of the time, we computed a number that was less than the true mean. So that's what confidence intervals are all about. You get a sample mean, and then you use your knowledge of the central limit theorem to compute a pair of quantities, one of which is pretty sure to be less than the true mean, the other of which is pretty sure to be greater than the true mean. Notice, the true mean mu is not a random variable. So you shouldn't say the probability that this mu is in between u and l is 95%. What you should say is instead, we've computed a couple of random variables based on our observations and our theoretical knowledge. And we've set them up so that one of them is pretty sure to be less than the true mean, the other pretty sure to be greater. And we can do them both at the same time now. So I'll set up another blank plot. And this time, what I will do is after taking my sample, I will compute L and U for the confidence interval. If they both work, that is, if L is indeed less than the true mean, U is greater than the true mean, I'll add 1 to my counter. And the first 100 times, I will generate a plot. Now look at that red line. We've got 100 confidence intervals plotted. And most of the time, the red line cuts the confidence interval. But every once in a while, it misses, either because the confidence interval is entirely to the right or because the confidence interval is entirely to the left. What fraction of the time did the confidence interval intersect the true mean? 94.4%, pretty close to 95%.
Now, the catch with this is that we made the unrealistic assumption that we knew the variance, but we didn't know the mean. In the real world, usually, we know neither the mean nor the variance, and we have to estimate the variance. You know how to do that by using the sample variance. And that's what student T is all about. So let's start by checking the theory behind the student T distribution. Since the difference between this and the normal distribution is most extreme for small samples, I'm going to take a sample of only five from the same normal distribution we've been using. I compute its mean, and since now I'm assuming that I don't know the standard deviation or variance, I'm going to compute the quantity s squared, the sample variance, which is exactly what the r function var gives us. And this time it came out to 0 0.66, much, much less than the true variance. That's what leads to those long, flat tails on the student t distribution. When you take a small number of samples, you've got a reasonable chance of computing a sample variance that's much less than the true variance. Let's start by checking the central limit theorem still works for the sample mean. I'm going to work with 10,000 samples, and what I will do is take the sum of the samples and then divide not only by n, but also by sigma squared. This is the square of a standardized normal random variable. It should have a standard normal distribution. That looks kind of bell-shaped, and the fit is just gorgeous. Next, what about the sample variance? Well, it was a lot of work, but we figured out that n minus 1 times sigma squared, sorry, n minus 1 over sigma squared times the sample variance has a chi-squared distribution. We can check that. We're going to generate n samples, and then we will calculate the sample variance, multiply by n minus 1, and divide by sigma squared, and plot a histogram of the result. Say, that looks like a gamma distribution to me. Well, you're right, because a chi-squared distribution is a special case of the gamma distribution. And if I overlay the density function for the chi-squared distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. A theoretical triumph, we have an almost perfect fit to this statistic. Now we can work on the studentized variable. The idea of the studentized variable is that the true standard deviation sigma shows up in both the numerator and denominator and cancels out. So what do we have to do this time? After we generate our sample, we compute the sample mean. In the numerator, we have the sample mean minus mu. In the denominator, we have the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of samples. The numerator and denominator are independent and after a substantial amount of work in the lecture notes, I showed you that this has the student t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Well, we can check that. This is what the histogram looks like, and you say, oh, it's bell-shaped. Looks like a normal distribution to me. But let's check. Here is the graph for the student t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom a near perfect fit. If we use the standard normal distribution instead, we get a higher peak, but we've got much, much thinner tails. And that's the important thing about the student t distribution. Because of the probability that the sample standard deviation might turn out to be fairly close to zero, you have a substantial probability of generating a result that's far away from the center of the distribution. And we use that now 
to calculate a student t confidence interval. So I'll set up my blank plot, prepare to do a thousand trials, and what am I going to do? I am going to get my random sample, calculate L, that's the sample mean, only now what I'm adding on and subtracting, hmm, I should be, oh no, no, I'm using the quantile for 0 0.025, which is negative, T distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, and then I multiply that by the standard deviation, but that is the standard deviation computed as the square root of the sample variance. This is not the true parameter for the population distribution, and I divide it by the square root of n as before. I do the same thing with u, only I use the 97 and a half quantile, and I generate a lot of confidence intervals. Every time I draw a sample and add and subtract this quantity, I get a different interval. Most of them intersect the vertical red line, which is the true mean, but every once in a while I'm unlucky. I generate something that lies entirely to the left, or I generate something that lies entirely to the right. If I succeeded, then, well, let's see what fraction of the time I succeeded. I got to add to my counter, if L was less than the true mean, U was greater than the true mean, and that happened 95.4% of the time. In order to do this, not only did I have to use the sample standard deviation, the only thing that's available to me, but I had to use the quantiles for the student t distribution. That's 2.77, pretty big. If I'd used a standard normal distribution, I would have used roughly 1.96. Well, this is a great statistical technique, and not surprisingly, it's been automated for the benefit of folks who don't understand all the rather complicated math that's underlying this. So here is student t for the uninitiated. You generate a sample, you call the R function t dot test, and it says, given the sample you found, the confidence interval is 22.1 to 25.4. There's a 95% probability that with those endpoints, you've generated numbers, one of which is less than the true mean, the other of which is greater than the true mean. Generate a new sample, you get quite a different confidence interval. These confidence intervals are, in fact, what I was graphing over here. So now you know all about student T, and if you're over 21, I would suggest you go out and buy a Guinness and celebrate.